Hello and welcome to the season three premiere of the CFA Society San Francisco podcast, where we interview and discuss current topics with leading members of the Bay Area investment community. This week, Tanya Subatang, Senior Membership Manager with CFA Society San Francisco, sits down with Octavio Sandoval, Director of Investments at Illumin Capital. Listen in as they discuss alternative investing and the impact of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Good morning, Octavio. How are you today? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm good. How's the summer been treating you? I can't complain, but the recent heat wave is... uh... Let's just say I'm over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think anyone this is waits for you because it's been a torture. But I'm glad to have you back. You had traveled to Europe not too long ago. So welcome back to the States. It's good to be back. So I always love to ask this question because I think it kind of sets you and our listeners to kind of understand exactly what you do and where you come from, right? So you're currently the Director of Investment at Illumin Capital. And for those who may not be familiar with Illumin Capital, can you share with us more about the company and what your role entails? Sure. Uh, For those who are not familiar with Illumin Capital, it was founded by my boss, uh, Darren Donston, in 2019. And Illumin Capital tries to address capital allocation decisions and how they're being done today. Uh, The impetus for why Illumin exists is very simple. If you look at all the assets being managed throughout the world, 98.3% of those assets happen to be managed by a homogenous group of folks, meaning that there's not enough women um, having access to that capital, meaning that not enough uh, diversity at the top. And so here at Illumin Capital, we in particular focus on working with fund managers and putting them through a bias reduction program so that they could become uh, better uh, decision makers by being more inclusive, which in theory, we hope would lead to uh, alpha generation. Wow, that's quite impressive and very timely, I would I would say, given um, the temperature of the world and the industry and all the changes that's happening. I'm curious to get your opinion, but why do you think it's important for companies like Illumin Capital to exist? Yes. Again, the folks who are getting access to capital aren't necessarily representative of the world that we live in. And so the decisions are being made aren't optimal. And if we want a better tomorrow, we have to put money into the hands of the folks of those who, you know, look like the economy. And uh, as of right now, that hasn't been the case. Do you feel, and obviously we're doing this in audio so people can't see you, but I can see you and you you come from a very diverse background. And I think it's really important and I want our listeners to understand how very synchronized you are with the company that you're working for because you also come from a very humble background. And so this is a two-pronged question. First is... Can you share with us a little bit of your journey and your background so our listeners can understand? But the second question I have for that is, did that play an influence with you for working for a company like Illumin Capital, having worked with very traditional firms very early on in your career? Yes. uh, My uh, background is is unique uh, to the asset management space. I was born and raised in the South Bronx. So I had a humble beginnings. Uh, to put things in perspective, my parents uh, were, Im- well, are immigrants. My mom immigrated from Guatemala and my father immigrated to uh, to the U.S. from Honduras in hope of starting a family uh, and put them in a position to, you know, have a successful family. And I grew up watching my parents work multiple jobs to make ends meet. And that's where I really learned uh, my work ethic. Um, I remember my mom every morning would wake up 4.30 and then um, come back to the house 9 p.m. and do it all over again. And she didn't have any days off. And so she's uh, been very instrumental to uh, how I am as a person. So I was able to, you know, develop a work ethic at a young age. I was mm-hmm. fortunate to get out of the, the unfortunate situation of living in the projects mm-hmm. and go to a prep school in Connecticut. To give you some context, um, JFK attended uh, my prep school, which is Chope Rosemary Hall. Wow. was able to do good work there, was looked at by uh, Cornell University, was able to graduate from Cornell in 2010. And then as you 
mentioned, I have had a series, several um, careers throughout uh, Wall Street at established firms. I started at uh, J.P. Morgan 2010 and then transitioned to Wells Fargo Private Wealth. And then I decided that I wanted to pursue an MBA. I wanted mm-hmm. to do more. And uh, at my uh, uh, MBA program, which was at uh, MIT Sloan, I was able to really learn about impact investing. I was able to get my, I was able to pass my CFA level three exam. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and I realized, you know, with the CFA charter that I should probably consider investing. And um, that's when I really reached out to a lot of uh, institutional investors and I was fortunate to get an offer to join Mass Mutual. And um, at Mass Mutual, I was the director of alternative investments. And I will say that at Mass Mutual is where I learned how to become an institutional investor. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mass Mutual, for those who don't know, is a uh, life insurance company, but they manage uh, roughly $300 billion when I was there. And I was responsible for putting a portion of that capital to work into the term for investment space, whether that's private equity, private credit, structured credit, and a lot of uh, niche um, strategies in the private markets. And so I was fortunate to, you know, be at Mass Mutual for four years. I think the highlight at Mass Mutual was in 2020 when I was awarded a mandate to not only invest capital into emerging fund managers who are diverse, but also invest in BPOC-led startups. I exhausted that budget in 2021, and um, Mass Mutual wanted to just wait and see how the portfolio would shape out. And that's the time I used to you know, test the market uh, because I felt like I really enjoyed what I did and I wanted to continue. And I was, you know, very young and hungry, mm-hmm. and um, <laughs> so I decided to test the market. And I was fortunate to meet uh, Darren Dobson uh, and apply for the director of it of investments role at Illumin Capital. Um, and so this is the first time I have ever had a uh, boss who is black. Uh, for those who don't, uh, who can't see me right now, I'm black. And <laughs> I've been at probably, including internships, 10 firms mm-hmm. at least. And uh, this is the first time I have had a, a black boss. And so it's, um, you know, refreshing um, um, to, to have that. And we know that there are challenges of running a, a fund as a, you know, historically overlooked uh, uh, person. So mm-hmm. I'm excited to be here to discuss that. Yeah, I mean, that's impressive. I mean, if we just kind of go back a little bit to what you were saying, you have your CFA, that those exams are, are no joke. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> you have, yeah, you have your CFA yeah. designation, your Chi Edge um, designation. You went to Cornell University. You got your MBA for MIT. I mean, that's quite impressive. You know, you should be very proud of yourself. And I'm curious, you know, you you went to the same prep school, JFK, and I think, wow, what shoes to fill? And I'm sure your family's extremely proud of you. But looking back at it, what was some of the biggest lessons did you take away? And maybe that still kind of resonates with you at your older age. Yeah, yeah. Um, It's funny. uh, Last week, uh, uh, Darren asked me, you know, what are the qualities you look for in a best friend? And um, the qualities... Uh, luckily, are consistent uh, when I was in high school and until now. Uh, and that number one quality is um, if you can continue to, you know, help me grow mm-hmm. and you challenge me to be better. Uh, I think that's the number one quality that I look for. Mm-hmm. And so when I was at Choke, I was surrounded around, yes, you could say elitists uh, who had uh, strong networks. However, the common denominator between me and those folks with uh, with a, a privileges or advantages uh, were that we have a burning desire to grow mm. and learn. And um, that's the common thread you'll see. That's one of the reasons why I decided to, you know, give up a good paying job to, you know, pursue a MBA at MIT. That's one of the reasons why I, I wanted to, you know, pursue the CFA program. Um, and some people thought I was crazy at Sloan because, <laughs> because Sloan is, well, MIT is known for a rigorous academic program. Mm-hmm. But not only that, I was studying for <laughs> the uh, CFA uh, level three exam. So mm-hmm. a lot of folks thought I was crazy, but I just think that this story just shows how much I want to learn and grow. Mm-hmm. 
Now, obviously, having come from parents who are not born and raised in the U.S., who have English as their second language, did you always know you wanted to have a career in finance and investment? Or did you, growing up, think you wanted to be something else more traditional, like a doctor or a lawyer? Yeah, um, so... There's some truth to the saying, you are a product of your environment. So when I was growing up, everyone wanted to be a rapper, basketball player, <laughs> um, whatever it. you saw on TV, which was, you know, stereotypical. Um, and then um, I was fortunate to, uh, I was fortunate to join a charter school for my middle school at uh, KIPP Academy, Knowledge is Power program. And they opened a world of possibilities for me. I didn't think that I'd be, you know, leaving the Bronx. Uh, or, you know, New York City, broad, broadly speaking, until I uh, went to KIPP Academy. And um, they even uh, introduced the notion of me going away for high school. And um, this is our little secret. I, I was a pretty bad student uh, in fifth <laughs> and sixth grade. And so when I heard, oh, there's a possibility of you going away for school, I thought I was getting sent to boot camp <laughs> 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 because I didn't know what it, prep schools meant. I didn't think that was possible where you That's could. That's true. <laughs> yeah, where, you know, and it makes sense because show at that time cost $35,000 for, you know, room board and everything you needed to have a successful one year at show. Um, and so when I got to the application process for Choke, I obviously didn't come from the, you know, back, the typical Choke background and my parents couldn't even afford, you know, let mm-hmm. alone 3000 a year for school. Um, and so they're not going to be able to afford 35000 And so my mentor, uh, David Levin, um, introduced me to a woman named Julie Goodyear, who runs the Icon Scholars Program. Mm-hmm. And um, Icon Scholars Program uh, happens to be funded by the activist Car Icon. And so as part of this program, each year, every scholar would meet with Car Icon at his hedge fund in uh, Midtown at the um, General Motors building and have a conversation with him. And so when I first met him, I was just um, blown away by the views of Central Park that he had. Uh, and then I was blown away that he was uh, able to, you know, give back um, to the community. And so I, that piqued my interest in finance in some shape or form. I thought, hey, I want to be able to be an investor like Haraika and then give back to the community. Um, and so that's why I when I got back from, from my frequent visits with Kai Icon, I was very hungry to find you know, internships on Wall Street. And uh, he was able to help me with that as well. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been very fortunate to be stepping in an office that overlooks Central Park. And for those who are not familiar, it's a gorgeous view and it's very inspiring <laughs> and motivating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so thank you for sharing with us your background. And obviously coming from the South Bronx to where you are now, that's quite a journey. Do you feel that because of your humble background and your personal experience has influenced or impacted you on the way that you think of things and maybe the way that you might um, handle business decisions, especially in your current role? Yeah, yeah. Um, It's important to stay grounded. Um, I learned that at a very young age that, you know, if you still, if you focus on your lane on your race um, in terms of, you know, what you're contributing to any organization or university or academic institution. I learned that just focusing on you and making sure that you grow, how far you've grown is very important. And that's a philosophy that I continue to have today because it's easy to want to be in different situations. However, it, you just never know what others are going through. And, you know, just because folks um, have, you know, access to wealth doesn't mean that they're having the best lives. Mm-hmm. And um, I've been reminded of that constantly when I, when I was at Choke, at Cornell, uh, even having, you know, careers on, on Wall Street. Um, it's it's different when you're, you know, it's different when you are considering other people, you know, experiences and you just never know what they've gone through. And so I think the, the takeaway is that just stay humble, just focus on yourself because everything else is just outside noise. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's the message I wanted to say here. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like that a lot. So 
kind of shifting a little bit, um, you talked a little bit about giving back and different organizations that's kind of helped you. In addition to your position as director of investments, you actually also donate a lot of your time to different organizations as well. Can you share with us what those organizations are and why you've chosen them to volunteer? Yeah. So the top uh, top of mind, uh, one of the reasons why I decided to leave my trip to Europe to come back to the U.S. earlier than I wanted, um, I uh, donated a lot of my time to KIPP Academy. I spoke about them a little bit, Mm -hmm. but um, let's give them some um, air time. So KIPP, Kip Academy, as I mentioned, st- stood for Knowledge is Power Program. Mm-hmm. And um, if you have read the book by um, Malcolm Gladwell, it's called Outliers. There's a whole chapter dedicated towards the KIPP model. And uh, my founder, um, David Levin, um, he had a vision and he wanted to, you know, show the world that the education system could be changed by just giving simple access to resources to underserved or uh, disadvantaged uh, communities. And um, and I think this was like a social experiment uh, that really uh, became um, his legacy. Um, so what he decided to do was he went through the South Bronx looking for kids and he was knocking on projects doors. He was knocking on random strangers homes looking for kids. And his goal was simple. I will take your kids, give them access to quality teachers. At that time, they tended to be teachers from Teach for America. Give them access to a world outside of the Bronx. Um, each year, there was a trip um, to, you know, whether it was to California, to Utah, uh, you name it. And then I will make sure they get into good high school programs so that they'll be in good position to go to a very competitive college. And so... He took me and mind you, I told you I was a pretty bad student, um, middle school. I was probably, probably adding, I was averaging C's and D's. Oh, wow. um, but yeah. And so he took me, uh, gave me the resources. He made learning fun and I think the rest is history. And so I say, I talk about this story because I wouldn't be in this position if it weren't for Kip, right? Uh, if it weren't for Kip, I wouldn't have gone to Choke Rosemary Hall. And so my, this felt like it's important for me to you know, share my story and give back to the community. And so tomorrow it's our KIPP Alumni Summit in uh, Washington, D.C. Okay. And um, I'm privileged to be a, a panelist for a number of sessions for the KIPP Summit because mm-hmm. I want to make sure that you know students from disadvantaged communities have hope. And so KIPP gave me hope and I want to return the favor. And that's one of the reasons why I continue to donate my time, whether it's speaking engagements for KIPP, whether it's being mentors to current college students who went through the KIPP programs. I just feel like it's very important for me to, you know, give back to the community. That is amazing. And that's definitely something we need, you know, and, and representation, everybody says, is is what everybody understands to be quite important, right? Because you need somebody to look up to. Otherwise, you don't know what doors and opportunities there are for you. Mm-hmm. I'm curious. I mean, what, what what did your parents do and say? You know, I mean, that is quite an opportunity. Were they, you know, maybe dubious about it? Or were they reluctant? Or were they kind of like, well, okay, we, we, we go ahead. <laughs> Was that a decision they left up to you? In regards to to oh to taking the opportunity with um with Kip yeah it was um all right, so one thing you should know about the Kip um process when it comes to recruiting they make students or uh, prospective students sign a contract as well as their parents and so I give dedication you some principles. yeah I give you some principles you know making sure you're you're always on time to you know class making sure you complete all your homework. Kip model at that time, I would go to classes from seven in the morning until six p.m. So that was in the contract, and then you had classes on the weekends. Oh, so that wow. was on the contract, and then you had summer school. And I always thought summer school was for bad students. Uh, <laughs> no, it was uh, for everyone to continue to learn, and um, and so that was part of the contract. And so. When my mom read it, she thought, oh, I don't need to hire, you know, someone to babysit. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, this is probably a good opportunity and there's no cost. 
for her. So um, no it, brainer, mom. It, it was a no brainer for her. <laughs> and then it was the best decision um, that we made uh, collectively. So wow. far. Your parents would be so incredibly proud of you and, and everything yes. that you've accomplished. So good job, mom. Definitely way to go. And <laughs> having her think that. That's, <laughs> that we right. Should not. <laughs> That's right. So obviously your platform and your expertise is an alternative. And so I'm, cur- I'm, I'm really curious on your thoughts on this. D&I, ESG and impact investing, they're no longer buzzwords. They're be more and more investors, especially the younger generations, are wanting to invest in companies that ingrain these kind of cultures and beliefs. What changes do you think that will make for the industry as a whole? Yeah, the industry is taking notice. Um, you know, the talent is the next generation. And if you want to keep the talent, you have to appeal to them. So the industry is changing for the better. However, the assets that are being managed throughout the, the world continues to be managed by, you know, a homogenous uh, group of folks. And so um, I think there needs to be a more dialogue at the top around change. And, you know, change is hard. And if you're um, in your 50s, managing portfolios the same way you have done for, you know, 20 to 30 years, how do you change the mindset of someone like that? And so it's very important to continue to, you know, engage with the next generation so that you could become, you know, more nimble and adapt the, uh, and then you could adapt to the you know industry trends more. So I think that's what's happening. I am seeing a lot of conversations. Mm-hmm. And now I wanted to you know share a quick story yeah. since I just had a business meeting in London with an asset manager that's um, raising a billion dollars, and they already have had you know commitments from sovereign wealth funds, um, and and um, one of the investments that they made out of that fund or portfolio. They included in a term sheet that the next board member has to be a woman. And wow. um, and I felt really good about that because this is coming from a, a firm that, you know, has been historically um, run by, you know, white males. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for them to, you know, try to, you know, do something different. And they showed me the term sheet and I thought they were just, you know, trying to you know, sell me, but they actually showed me the term sheet and it literally said that. And, and obviously there was a, you know, time frame. I think it was three, three years, within three years. Oh, but wow. I feel like that's, we need to see more of that and mm-hmm. to have that and legal documentation, um, like a, you know, contract. I, I, I thought that was beautiful. Yeah. I think that's amazing. And, and I love seeing that too, as well. So that's great. And I'm sure that probably made you feel great and feeling that you you have in hand and kind of helping change the world in some indirect way <laughs> and yes indirect way yes for sure <laughs> there's a lot that needs to be done yeah um i have two more questions before i let you go um one is if you were to look back in your experience and maybe you're talking to a young Octavio or maybe someone like you in the South Bronx in might not be having good grades at the moment. What advice would you give them in life or in general? Yeah, you know, there's that adage, improve your network to improve your net worth. And um, this, I wouldn't be here without the network of, you know, mentors, whether they happen to be Car Icon or whether it happens to be David Levin or whether it happens to be, you know, my big brother or uh, my big uh, uncle. Uh, there's, you got to surround yourself with folks who want to challenge you and and they motivate you to, to be better. And by having that style of life, you're going to, you know, grow a lot and opportunities will start to come to you. And so that would be my uh, word of advice is, you know, expand your network, but make sure you are intentional about who's in that network and make sure that they honestly or genuinely care for your growth and development. Mm, I love that. Well, that, that's a perfect segue to my other question. And I always ask this to all my guests is who inspires you and why? Yeah, that's a no brainer. Um, my mom, um, she uh, immigrated from answer. Guatemala, um, but I, I should give some context to to, um, where she's from. She's from a very small island called Livingston. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a very, very, very poor island. I 
go to this island every year to remind myself of the journey Mm -hmm. uh, and to stay humble, as you mentioned earlier, because this island, I was just there for Christmas. I spent Christmas with my mom on that island. And, um, you know, she's, you still have to, you know, wash clothes by hand. <laughs> and then <laughs> I, I can't do that. There's no hot water. Oh, wow. Um, and then um, when you take a shower, there's really no shower. You use a bucket of water. So you have a big <laughs> bucket and then you have a scooper. And then when you do laundry, it's uh, outside and you, like, yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, a different world. And the lights will go off on you in the middle of the day <laughs> while you're having a, uh, family dinner during the evening and it's just uh, an incredible place um, but this reminds me of how far uh, we came and mm-hmm. it keeps me grounded and my mom to this day still wants to you know go back to that island and I said mom you know you, you saved a lot of money you could probably you know have better you know living conditions but she's still rooted to that island and, wow. and I think that helps me uh, stay rooted to, you know, where I came from and Mm -hmm. keeps me humble. Wow. That's a great story. I mean, that's amazing. That's, that's like purposely living on Survivor. (laughs) Yeah, that's how it felt. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But that must be also amazing. I mean, mean, is there internet there? Can you get Wi-Fi access? The internet is bad. I remember (laughs) it was so hot that uh, we had the ceiling fan, but you know, when it's so hot and humid, the the ceiling fan feels like it's blowing hot air. Yeah, yeah. it's not helping. So I know I was complaining about the heat wave, but, you know, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> I should be prepared because uh, because of what I had to go through uh, by, you know, visiting that island. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I think it sounds like a great place too because you can kind of decompress. Like you can't get good cell service, I'm sure, or Wi-Fi. That's exactly right. And you kind of like stripping yourself down. So what a perfect right. spot. Maybe that's why your mom. Yeah, and you get to be in tune with uh, nature. So um, that island is known for Rio Duce, which has over, I kid you not, a thousand species of um, orchids. And so oh, yeah. I'm like swimming in this river. It's pure. Uh, no one in there. And you're just one with nature. So. Oh, my goodness. So I think your mom probably did that for you guys. Is she still being That's your right. mom? That's right. That's <laughs> right. Well, Octavia, thank you so much for your time. I absolutely enjoyed my time talking with you. And I hope you Likewise. had a great time, too. <laughs> Likewise. All right. Well, we'll definitely see you around. And... I look forward to seeing what comes up with you next. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the season three premiere of the CFA Society San Francisco podcast. We hope you enjoyed the engaging discussion. Please stay tuned for more episodes of this podcast featured every fourth Tuesday in our weekly newsletters and through the CFA Society San Francisco podcast channel available through most major podcast apps.